Yeah, hello, here is Heidi again from the wisdomfactory.net in Conversations That Matter. And we want to start in the new year with some inspiration with somebody who is having <laughs> more heat wave than a cold wave, which we might have in Europe. Uh, Joy Forley, she is in, new, uh, in uh, Australia, in Queensland. I wanted to say New Zealand because Queensland, New Zealand seems the same, but it's a little bit different, no? So I'm looking forward to talking to you and to get to know a little bit more about the situation where you live and the projects you are having and the invitations you can reach out to people to, to learn something about nature. And as you see, she is already in nature and it looks quite promising. <laughs> So first, uh, tell us a little bit about you and then about the special situations. We, we know that Australia was very hit by, and yeah, we can name it fires, no? I mean, like in, in, in uh, California and everywhere, and how that impacted you, how it impacts the life and what could be possible solutions. And I, we have a lot to talk about. So first to you. <laughs> Okay, then I'll just introduce myself. So I'm yes. Joy Foley, like you've just found out. I'm a New Zealander originally. I've spent most of my life in Europe, though. I spent 12 years in the UK and then 18 years in Germany. And I came to Australia following a vision quest uh, to set up the project, which is called Peace Valley, which is where I am currently. And that was three years ago. And in that three years, it's gone from vision and dream to reality. Yeah. And Peace Valley is a place where you can reconnect to yourself, connect with each other and reconnect with nature. And um, I utilize uh, the idea of embodied learning rather than teaching, because I, I believe that we can use all of our senses to learn not just our sort of vision and our left brain and that we have a more holistic learning if we utilize all our senses. So Peace Valley is based around um, sort of meditation, sacredness of, of land and the law, uh, like the Aboriginal L-O-R-E. So their law is like the law of nature and um, it's about a deep reverence for all beings. And uh, it was interesting, it was only once I got to Australia that I realized the uh, values and ethics that I uh, stand for, that I have as the foundation for Peace Valley, actually correspond pretty much identically with their uh, ethos and ethics. So that's been a really lovely thing to find out. And it's also helped me link uh, with them quite quickly, which is unusual here, because it's colonial land with a long and very checkered history that's not a very yeah. pleasant story yeah. so how is it I, I imagine that it's a wide land and only a few people living there is it true or I mean how far are the next people away from you and and where are the Arab uh, aborigines living uh, we have no idea in our country so <laughs> tell us a little bit about that okay so having <laughs> been living in Germany near Munich for a long time I was very naive and I thought I'd be able to come over here and I could um, give up my car and still live out in the country and use public transport. Well, forget it. <laughs> the distances are just too great and there's no public transport. So sadly, I do still have to use a car. So to give you an idea, uh, the nearest place that has, um, that's worth visiting in terms of shopping, uh, like for things you can't grow yourself, is a 45 minute drive. Um, in the valley that I'm in here, there are probably five farms and that's a 30 minute drive from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. So maybe five families in that distance. Yeah. And the uh, local Aboriginal people are in the other direction. They are about an hour and a half drive away, the nearest um, families. And... Usually here, um, what I've noticed, and this is just my personal experience, is that the, um, the First Nations people or the Aboriginal people keep pretty much to themselves. They, um, there's a lot of structural prejudice, I suppose you could call, 
where just their daily lives are impacted by that. And um, they tend to spend time together rather than mixing with the um, European Australians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I've developed this lovely relationship so quickly is quite miraculous. Yeah. yeah, I'm wondering, is there still a lot of resentment to being invaded by foreign people or how is that? Because I think a little bit about now we in Europe uh, getting all the refugees and we have so much resentment that other people come to our country, although they are not invaders, you know. In Australia, they were probably, probably real invaders, you know, they took the country. So... Uh, how, how, how does it leave the, the native population? How do you feel that? Um... There's, like, there's lots of different stories around that. And um, where does one start? It's such a big and complicated um, story. Yes, they were invaded. Uh, it would be technically called genocide, what, part, what, what happened here. Um, right through until very recently, you could still call it genocide because they were still taking children from um, First Nations people right up until recently. Canada. In fact, now, yeah, now they take them under the um, under the guise of um, a child protection thing. But in fact, it's still removing them from their own family and putting them in a white family and so on and so on. So it is still effectively removing their heritage. So, yeah, so there is a lot of um, anger and resentment in sections of the First Nations people. There's also a lot of dysfunction because they're descended from situations of great violence. Um, an example, this is quite horrific, but it's not uncommon. I was at a, an event last year and the elder man who was sharing and holding the ceremonies told a short story about when he was a boy sitting on his grandfather's knee and his grandfather telling him that the white people pushed all the women off the cliff first then threw the children down on top of the dead bodies of their mothers and the men were left to watch and then pushed off the cliff. So the grandfather was still holding the memory of that horror in his body. And so if you have, um, you have an intergenerational trauma that's being passed on generation for generation, you've got epigenetics playing a role. And then you've also got the role of the, um, if you like, the perpetrators who are also carrying the grief the families of the perpetrators are still are also traumatized. So Australia is a nation of traumatized people. And I was quite, um, I hadn't realized, I hadn't realized until I came here quite how it was. I'd, I'd been well and truly taken in by the stories of sun and beach and surf and she'll be right, mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's also one of the reasons why I contacted you to talk a little bit about that, because as you know, I was in South Africa and I didn't travel very much in my life, but seeing this very different reality, it sort of, live, how do you say, the three dimensions, our own things which are going on in our countries, you know, uh, what, what we think is not going well and what we have to complain about and things like that. Oh, people think what is happening in other countries, what has happened in other countries, what our ancestors have done in other countries or also in our own countries, instead of complaining about, I don't know what, you know, the minor things which are not uh, going well. Yeah, they are not going well, but that's so unimportant. Anyway, I wanted to, to, to learn a little bit more about, about other realities, and especially from somebody who has known European reality, who has known the perfect Germany, you know, <laughs> and then coming into, into the bush practically and uh, finding reality. You at the beginning said at the beginning it was a vision and a dream and now it's reality. Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
I'd love to. Um, just before I move into that, though, I would like to add in that the Aboriginal or the First Nations elders that I've met have been the most generous, loving, open, compassionate people I think I have ever met. Um, and they don't hold anger and resentment. It's like they've worked through it. So there are lots of levels within what's happening here. And I've been very, very lucky that I've um, met such beautiful people. I think they have been working very hard at healing the wounds. Um, a lot of the European people here have been sitting still in denial. So I think that's just worth mentioning. Yeah. Yeah, and I do think that uh, generally in the Western world, also America, they don't think about coming to terms with their own perpetratedness, no? As soon as you are a victim, ha, 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 you can shout everything. Everybody's doing wrong to you. But we have not a big culture of working with shadow. Uh, I mean, mm. in Germany, yes, we try for quite a while. But I think that's the, one of the exceptions of the Western world, you know. We don't, also in Italy, shadow work, mm, America. I mean, I was so astonished when Mark came here, you know, my late husband from America, and he said, nothing. They don't learn anything in school. There is no public discussion about the, the genocide they have done. <laughs> American is great again, you know. So, <laughs> so um, it, is, it is really, we always say these are primitive people, but I think they are much less primitive than we are in, in a very, very profound sense. You know, they are still human. Yeah, we have yeah. become sort of half humans, half, I don't know what, machines. <laughs> Absolutely. That thought paradigm that we're stuck in isn't a very healthy one. No. But yes, I think that's true. Um, what appears to me is the history of Australia is the people's hair focused on social technology and they managed to live here possibly 120,000 years without ever having war. <laughs> it doesn't mean they didn't fight but they developed social technologies that were good enough that that actually prevented war and held their population stable. So I think that in itself says a lot about their um, sophistication. Maybe yeah. we could go and learn a little bit because when I see the news, when I see whatever, it's all about guns, about war, about fighting, about aggressive competition. I'm not against competition when it's a benevolent competition, but it's like kicking the others out, no? A zero, yeah. uh, some games and so on. And... That's what I found also, um, at least I was told a lot uh, in South Africa that people in the, when we talk about integral in a purple mindset, they have a different way of being together. Maybe from one tribe to the other, there can be war and we saw it in genocides there too. But uh, in, in their own group, um, they are very loving and you always belong and when you are adopted, there was Renée de Beer uh, talking about that she was, and also a la force in my serious uh, integral African dialogues. They said when they are adopted or in, a, in a tribe, you know, they are a lifelong uh, part of this tribe and they will always be cared for and considered, you know. Sure, when you are outside the tribe, it's a little bit different and that would be the next step. And I'm wondering if that has happened in Australia or were they far enough apart not to enter into war? <laughs> um, I don't think so. I think it was from what I've learned, and remembering that I'm just new here and um, my knowledge is based around what I've read. Um, one of the things that I think is a really lovely tool for that is they have song lines here, which you may have heard of. And a song line is, um, is a, path effectively through the country and the people's hair go on walkabout and they follow these lines and these lines are knowledge holding lines like you have mnemonics so when you're walking along a song line you're actually walking along uh, multiple layers of knowledge 
it's physical knowledge of the land, it's um, knowledge of the creatures of the land, it's then knowledge, spiritual knowledge about the, the origin stories of the land. And these lines inter interconnect and crisscross all over Australia. And in this one little book I read, um, it was one of a relatively early, uh, I think relatively early um, European man who was uh, living for a while with some uh, First Nations people. And he documented that they have this tool where each family nation has a stewardship role for their country and the song line crosses their country and keeps going through other families you know can go through several different families lands and at the border one elder in each nation holds that ultimate responsibility for that land and at the border there's one person from each family on either side of the border that work together to maintain the song line for the benefit of both families. Mm. Nice. So because they've got that little tool, it's like a little social tool, a social technology. Uh, it's automatically meaning that the families are going to work together to maintain something rather than come to war. That's great. So isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. And here, when you're passing other people's uh, uh, ground, as uh, you, you put on shields, no, don't come in. I did it because they stole my wonderful um, mushrooms. So I said, don't come in again. <laughs> so the, the mentality is completely different. No? We have here fences everywhere and we don't want other people to come in. But if it's in a normal habit, people pass your land and it's a sort of a ritual and you welcome them. That makes a difference. Makes a big difference. And also you can't go onto somebody else's land without um, announcing that you're coming through and you wouldn't even think of it. It's a bit like we wouldn't go into somebody's house without knocking on the door. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same thing. So um, they don't need to have fences and lines because they all know where their borders are and they make sure that all the correct protocols followed. Yeah. And how is and it with the, of, yeah, with the white people coming in? Did they ever respect that? Well, they didn't understand it as far as I can mm -hmm. tell. So therefore, they because they didn't know about it, they didn't respect it out of ignorance, I suppose. Um, I don't actually know much of the white story because I was really lucky in that when I arrived, I was uh, invited to a, a small bunny festival up in Maryvale, which is not so far from here on the Queensland side of the border. And there I got introduced to the history of Australia from the First Nations perspective. So mm -hmm. being a non-Australian, I've not had that, um, if you like that indoctrination of the, um, the textbook history, according to the European settlers. I actually um, fell into the First Nations history, which was uh, pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, thank you. So let's go to, to the dream, to the reality, what you find is different reality from your visions. Right. Well, well, first, perhaps saying what the vision, the vision, what mm -hmm. happened just briefly. Would you like to hear that bit yes, of sure. a story? I'll make it very short. Um, so I, um, my children grew up and left home and my relationship broke down and I had to redefine who I was. And in that process had to work out what my values were. And I realized I had a deep love of nature and a deep love of earth and um, really wanted to work towards peace and um, healing the land. And as part of this sort of self-development thing that I was doing for a couple of years, I went to Fintorn in the north of Scotland that um, is a spiritual community that quite a few people have heard of. While I was there, a young man from Australia was at the same course I was at, which was called Applied Eco Village Living. He came up to me out of the blue and gave me the feather of a black cockatoo. 
and he told me that the black cockatoo was his, um, if you like, his power animal or his totem, and that he'd been given these feathers, that he'd been given more than one, and he was told that when he got to Scotland, he'd know who to give them to, and to more than one person. Um, and I received one of these black cockatoo feathers, having at that point absolutely no idea that I might ever be in Australia. I had no thought of leaving Germany at that point. So that was the beginning of the journey, uh, or that I was aware of anyway. So to cut a long story short, I continued looking. Um, I had the vision for the Peace Valley Project in my head for a long time. And it was really what I've explained, the reconnection to land through embodied learning. But I didn't know where it would be. And I, I took myself off on a vision quest. So I took my push bike um, that I normally used to go shopping on in town. And I cycled from north of Munich um, to Rome. I went down um, uh, Kufstein, Innsbruck over the uh, Brenner, down uh, Lago di Garda, Verona, and so on, all the way down to Rome. And uh, just not long before I got have, to Rome, I had... You could have passed by because you for sure passed by here in the valley. <laughs> Where I live. Possibly. Yeah. Quite possibly. Whereabouts are you exactly? Uh, it, it is about, uh, it's kilometer 73 from the Via Flaminia. So uh, you probably passed by Oviedo. I don't know which way you, you did. I'm Orte, near Orte. I don't know. No, I don't ring a bell. Anyway, I could have a look on a map and work it out. The bicycle yes, routes might be down. different than the car, uh, the, uh, the, the, the highways, you know, so. Anyway, you, yeah. in some way you pass by. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, I actually uh, got to Orvieto and I was getting pretty exhausted by then and um, I recently spoke to somebody and they talked about I had a breakdown breakthrough. <laughs> experience is what she called it and um, I was physically emotionally just completely wrecked by this point I'd been traveling for a few weeks I was going slowly but um, it was just the heat and the cycling in the daytime and and the not knowing and I kind of got to a point where I just didn't know anything anymore didn't even know whether I wanted to be on the bike anymore and then um, I sort of fell into this other state of being and there were no drugs involved. I just sort of, I fell into presence. Um, so what happened was time shifted in terms of uh, things. It was like things moved into a slow motion. Colors became very intense and sparkly, very filled with light. And um, this sort of, I was like in this state of complete I wasn't thinking very much, um, everything, I was filled with wonder, with just wonder at this beautiful world I was in. And at the end of that day, uh, which this, this mode could have continued in intensity, it fluctuated a little bit over the day, but I stayed in that mode pretty much all day. So I suppose instead of having a Zen moment, I had a Zen day. <laughs> and at the end of the day, there was, um, I just found a little bed and breakfast and I, um, I think I opened my emails or something and I got this um, very, very powerful knowing that was uh, quite interesting because it, I didn't hear voices or anything, but I knew, and it was words I knew. It was, you're going to Australia, that's your soul path, it's why you're on the earth and all the things that you've learned in your life, you're going to need for the project that you're going to do and um, basically get on with it, you know, like, yeah. So I did. <laughs> and the synchronicities then just were so fast once I said yes to that. Uh, within two days, I was sitting, I did finish the trip to Rome. I actually took a uh, train because I was so exhausted. I honored my body. And um, I was sitting by the poolside in a campground in Rome, writing to the people that own the house behind us now, um, who I'd never heard of before. Uh, talking to them about gift economy and the Peace Valley project. So, and here I am, three years later, uh, the project's wow. all set up. So, you already uh, had this project to, of Peace Valley, but you didn't know that it was to be in Australia, or how is it? Uh -huh. Yes, I didn't know which country. I knew, uh -huh. I, I actually had uh, six potential countries that I could have done it. 
I was invited to the Yucatan in Mexico. Um, I'd been to Santana Forest in India down near Oroville while I was traveling and um, the chap that runs that, Aviram, said that he'd be really happy for me to come and assist in managing one of his three projects and they're effectively the same thing. It's about healing the land and the trees to heal the people. And he had projects in India, in the Tamil Nadu, in Kenya, I believe, and in Haiti. So that was three countries. There's Yucatan, was Mexico was another one. Then there was a possibility of something happening in New Zealand, which is my homeland. And then this idea of Australia. And um, the, vision, the, the vision quest told me very, very particularly that I was to come here. And the, to end that story, where I am, I don't think they're going to fly past right now, but I'm living with black cockatoos. They fly in flocks. The glossy black cockatoos are very rare now. They're an endangered species. And this forest here, they live still in flocks. So the cockatoo called me here. Yeah, so you brought the feather back. <laughs> Effectively. <laughs> that is wonderful. So I'm just thinking when you, when somebody gets the idea I want to do a project. Okay, that you have thought about. And then comes the idea, now I'm on the way to Rome, but I go to Australia. How would you do that? Just, I mean, did you know anybody? Did you, I mean, how did you know that this was the place where you wanted to do your project? I mean, the specific place. How did it go yeah. on? Because I think many people have visions, but then after the visions, they don't know how, what to do. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, what happened for me was I was quite lucky because um, I'd actually been to this region of Australia. I've got two brothers living in Queensland and okay. one of them owns land over in the gorge, which is over the hill from where I am. I'll just show you the, the mountain. And um, that is what I call Nora Gorge. And that was where I had been to visit. Can you still hear me? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a, bit, a little bit broken, but you are back now, I think. Right. Okay. So um, the Campanora Gorge I'd been to visit and I'd seen it and it has a very, very special energy. And since... Um, when I came, that was where I thought the project was going to be based. But I actually ended up coming here, which is a 20 minute drive from the, the gorge. And it's looking like the next stage of this project, which is moving it up from just a very small pilot with just a few people coming through, uh, moving it into a big international um, intercultural learning center and land rehabilitation and water rehabilitation uh, center that that will take place over in the next valley at the head, which was the place that called me. So, um, and that is looking like it might be a collaboration with the Githable family, the local people from here. And we're in discussion at the moment about that. And I'm very soon going to go and talk to some landholders over there about um, how, what opportunities there might be for gaining, um, getting land there to put into trust. Um, the significance of that area is it's called the head and the head is the headwaters of the Condamine River which runs into the Murray-Darling system. The Murray-Darling River system is a little bit like the Amazon to, to Australia. It is the uh, main river system that runs all the way down the east coast and ends up down in South Australia before it gets to the sea. It's, um, and it's dying. Mm. In fact, in places, it's really the ecosystems have collapsed. So the idea of healing the headwaters is really important. It's healing the source, healing the source of the water and healing the source of the problems between the peoples of the country and healing the land and bringing back the indigenous knowledge and wisdom. So it has a really powerful um, vision, this next stage of the project. Uh, and and let's just see what happens, you know, mm -hmm. if what happens with synchronicities and, and so on, because basically I taken my personal savings and put it into this project so far. And I've come to a point where I've given 
all I can, which is all I've got. And mm. now for it to grow, it needs the universe to, to back me up. I've done like, if you like, my part of the bargain. I've set up the, the base project and the foundations for the project, made all the social connections. And um, yeah, now we'll see. And suddenly all sorts of things are happening, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Really exciting. Yeah, so you, so you would need some person who is interested and has a little bit money in the back and uh, because these projects they need money and also people interested maybe to collaborate uh, and to i mean effectively with a hand i don't know how how do you plan to 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 work i mean at the end you want also to to offer that as a tourist place as a healing place uh, and people pay you for that it's right, you know, because you have to, to when you invest so much money in, in that, then people need to, to contribute. But at the moment, while it is not yet in full, um, how do you say, completion, uh, uh, do you accept volunteers? Or I, I imagine that young people after school would like to, to help somehow. Mm -hmm. So um, the basic premise of the project is that it's run on a gift economy basis uh, because the gift economy is um, one of the many things that could be a tool to help heal the um, current paradigm of power over. Because mm -hmm. if, you, if you have money and you buy and you sell, there is a power, inherent power within that exchange whereas if it's a gift there's no power if it's a true gift it's about generosity and pleasure so there's no power there so i want to hold that in gift economy that's my um that's my aim and it's also in direct alignment with the law of the local aboriginal peoples because they didn't have money they had no need of money in in fact um a lot of indigenous cultures didn't use uh, a monetary um, coins or uh, because they like Ubuntu, for instance, like Ubuntu in Africa, you know, I am because you are and we share because we are one. Um, a lot of ideas like prevalent and I believe that we need to move into those kind of ideas if we're going to move out of this mess that we're in so for me the gift economy is really important but it because we're still using the money system and i still have to pay for stuff you know i offer a space and i ask people to donate according to what they feel the personal value is that they have gained from the experience of, of sharing the peace valley space and also what's appropriate for them in terms of their financial situation because I don't want to turn anybody away. I don't believe that having this experience of reconnecting to nature should be something purely for the rich and famous, which is currently often the case. If you want to go on a week's retreat in the bush, you can you can spend two, three, five thousand dollars. And I think that's really sad because there's a lot of people that have no money that might have real need of that experience and it might be life transformative experience for them so i'm i'm very passionate about staying in that space of gift so you are hoping in the goodness of people and in the uh how do you say trustworthiness and in the um, morality of of people to yeah Yes and no. When you know integral theory, you know that uh, all the lower stages, which we call lower stages, uh, to the people you are knowing here in the, the in the, the original people, and then with the red stage of development when egocentric uh, development comes online, then these people they would just you know get what they get <laughs> and don't give anything back. So what you are aiming to is a, a, a higher development uh, for, of at least in Western people. I don't think we have any more this purple way of, of being. So we need to be very conscious, and very, you know, rising up in our personal development to, to be able to, to, 
to be like this. So you probably, I hope so, will attract the sort of people who is not uh, aiming to cheat you, <laughs> but really uh, collaborating. Yeah, yeah. Idea. I hope it mm, will. I've had some interesting experiences. Pardon? Sorry. No, I, I was going to say, I've had some interesting experiences. I had one lady who, um, who came for four days and donated a jar of jam for the Asia. <laughs> And I had another lady who I helped plant some trees for three hours and she gave me $300. So I get very mixed reactions. And one of the things is about giving is not about giving with expectation. And that's been a learning curve for me. Because if I give with expectation of return, it's not a gift. Yeah, but you and must be very clear. Well. You must be very clear about that if you really want to give it away or if you think that then you will something, uh, want to have something back. And you know, we have to pay, pay attention, especially women who are um, historically sacrificing themselves for others. We have to be very attentive not to fall into this role again, give, 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 and not get anything back. So that's, that's a learning curve in itself. <laughs> Yeah, that's very true. And it is, um, yeah, it's about making safe boundaries, isn't it? Absolutely. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Very, it's very interesting. Anyway, what I'm finding that's quite, um, quite an eye-opener is that some people come possibly thinking that they're not going to donate very much. Or I've had people comment that they've been so impressed that they have given a bigger donation than they were thinking of doing so. They haven't exactly explicitly said it in those words, but I've been able to understand it that way. And I've had people come back. I've had quite a lot of people just say that they just, they've blown away. I think one of the things is because I hold the space um, and start the day uh, from a meditative um, standpoint so we start with a check-in and we start with a meditation so we're already setting a tone or setting a level of a way of being that's about presence that's about listening deep listening and um, and, and that in itself is, is quite a miracle for a lot of people because they've never even experienced that before they've never sat in circle so it's I'm enjoying it it's great fun yeah. And you know, you are part of these, all these little circles of people who are doing their work hidden, almost nobody knows about it because you don't shout, you don't, you know, uh, and the loud people, uh, which we hear everywhere in the, in, the, in the news and wherever, they don't represent the reality, but it seems as if the world was like they, represent it because what you are doing doesn't make news it doesn't make fear to anybody people want to have fear and panic and so they they only catch on these uh, horrible uh, doomsday news and things like that and all these initiatives like also Ben Roberts and so many people who are doing this you know there's so many uh, little and bigger organizations who are doing this grassroots work, I think you, you call that, no, really from the bottom up, but it is silent. And when you begin with meditation, that's no shouting out, oh, I'm doing blah, 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 I'm making publicity. No, it's just in silence. And that's what for me is bringing the hope in a real change. It won't come by politicians, it won't come by manifestations, by Friday for Future or stuff like this. It will come through the constant dedicated work behind the surface, let's say, behind, uh, uh, underneath the awareness of average people. And, oh yeah, thank you for doing that. <laughs> and for letting us oh, know, you know, because I, in a certain way I'm doing it too, but not with these consequences as you do it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be witness and to, I would love to come over and see you. <laughs> 
Well, if you do find yourself in Australia, I'm not recommending that you fly, just by the way, but if you did, for whatever reason, have to fly, you're more than welcome to come and stay. It would yeah. be a pleasure. Absolute How would you pleasure. go to, to, to Australia not flying? <laughs> <laughs> You'd by have to bike. have a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can both. <laughs> yeah, no. I can no. I'm not really against flying uh, because in my opinion, it is safer. Uh, and when, when the airplanes are really full, it's even better than going everyone alone in a car. So that's my idea. I don't know. I haven't been, done the calculations. Uh, going by bike is better for sure. But, <laughs> you know, I know the Italian hills. I have an electric bike and it, it's still heavy. <laughs> So I have an admiration that you did all the way down because this is really steep. Up, downward is nice, but upward, <laughs> Yeah. So what My are, knees are still telling me that I did a hard thing. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Can you repeat? Sorry. Um, my knee, my knees are still telling me that I did a hard thing. <laughs> they haven't recovered from the cycling, not properly. Yeah, I know, this is really, I sometimes think at least don't do it in the hot summer because it's, it's suicide to go with 38 centigrade on bike and these hills here. Sometimes I see some, normally see these are the Germans, you know, with a red head like this. And I say, oh God, how can you do that? <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, what is, what is now your situation? I heard you had to be evacuated because of the fires. And uh, how is yes, that impacting you? Well, and that's been pretty big. Yeah, pretty big indeed. Um, one start. More land has burned in Australia. Sorry, this the, the light's fading a little bit. Mm -hmm. So more land has burned in Australia than has burned in the Amazon this year. Everybody's heard about... Oh, you are, you are breaking up now. We've got rainforest burning. Yeah. Uh, let me just try, I'll turn it around again. Yeah. Is that better? If I'm not holding it, perhaps that's yeah. better. Okay. So um, the rainforest, ancient rainforest is burning that has never been dry ever. The forest that's been here since Gondwana land is burning. Um, and of course, the reality of that, which people quite glibly say, oh, the forests are burning. The actual reality of that means that there are creatures in there that are burning alive. Also, yeah. Mammals and frogs and snakes and little birds and insects. And they're burning and dying. And it's absolutely horrific. Um, so there's a fire about six kilometers from where I am now. It's nearly out at this end of the fire front. But because of the wind direction, it's still moving out. I'm sorry, we're, we're losing the light. <laughs> it's okay. I, okay. And um, so, yes, we evacuated when the wind turned and got quite strong and was bringing the fire directly towards us. We evacuated before they asked us to because we're in the middle of the forest. Like one, one side of us is this beautiful gully, um, Karela Creek, which is like a canyon. And then we're surrounded by rainforest and hoop pine forest and eucalypt forest. And it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. But right now it's very dry. So we left rather than risk being mm. here when it burned. And the firefighters have been doing a really good job and they have contained it at this end. And um, we're hoping that it won't come through. It might, but if it does, hopefully it'll come in a way that's not devastating for the forest, just in a way that's going to clean the undergrowth out yeah. and germinate some new seeds. Anyway, so it was pretty, pretty worrying. There was about six weeks when we had smoke 
around us pretty much all the time of varying degrees. And um, yeah, it was quite frightening a couple of times. Um, twice when we left, we had a sense of urgency that we really needed to be out because um, the smoke was so thick that you couldn't really see very clearly, you know, 10 meters in front. And everybody's everybody's developed a bit of a smoker's cough. Oh, sure. And so I'm at the top end of the fires in the northern New South Wales. Now going south in New South Wales, there is the little fire that's near us is 12, I think 16,000 hectare have burnt. And this is a small fire compared to the main fires that are happening further down. If you look at a map of Australia at the moment, you'll find there's a ring of fire around the entire country and the east coast down towards Sydney is just, I think there must be 80 or 100 fires still burning and they can't stop them because the, there's been a drought for so long. The forests weren't moist before the drought started and now everything is tinder dry and there's just no stopping them. So mm. it's devastating. It's horrible also when you are really preoccupied about CO2. Uh, uh, the burning is producing such a lot of CO2 at the, one, at the one side and on the other side is destroying the very means against and I mean the means who are attracting and neutralizing the CO2. So it's a double Double damage, in my opinion. So uh, coming back to your project, would, do you plan also to, to replant uh, the yes. trees? Yes. So, I mean, the fire hasn't come through here, but there will be remedial work to be done in the area. And if working with the local Githerable family, we're, we'll be working out on the land. Oops, now you are gone. You've gone now. Oh, here you are back. Yeah, yeah, here you are back. Okay, cool. Good. So at the headwaters, we're hoping to build a wildlife corridor. We're hoping to clean the water and cool it down, mend the ground that's been overgrazed and had um, uh, invasive grasses brought in from overseas and bring back the perennial local grasses. Uh, we want it to be an intercultural learning center based on Aboriginal knowledge, First Nations knowledge, combined with the best of Western so permaculture and um, forest gardening and all off grid and learning about how to live in harmony with the land in a simple way. So that's kind of the same as the Peace Valley, what it is now, mm -hmm. but in a much bigger, um, and, more, and more professional, I suppose, um, way. Because this, what I've done so far is effectively the pilot project. You know, I had a vision and in order for the world to believe me that I could see it through, I had to set something up so they could see that it was possible. Yeah. So I've done that and now I'm at the point where it can move into its uh, original vision. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I'm sort of stumbling uh, with my words. It comes immediately to my mind. Do you have, I mean, we are still, you are still need money for, to buy the, uh, the trees and whatever. Do you have a crowdfunding campaign or something going on where people could maybe be the patron of one tree or something or of 10 trees or how many they want to? Yeah, that's something that we're looking at at the moment. So I'm literally at this tipping point. Um, I've just got a little group of people that have got together in the last week. One lady wants to be my partner and come and move in to where I'm living at the Peace Valley um, camp with her children. And she brings a lot of skills. Um, she will also bring some money, I believe. I've got another lady that would like to be a media marketing person and I'm going to get her to do the crowdfunding um, thing. I've got, I'm, the Peace Valley project has been included in the Walking the Land um, group of projects that came out of the Climate Change Consciousness um, 2019 conference. And Walking the Land was to be a fundraising thing for a group of projects and mine 
I was really honored that I was added in kind of at the last minute because all of the other projects are indigenous led. All of the others are actually um, from third world countries or um, indigenous American or, and, and mine is because the ethos of mine is so in alignment they really wanted to add mine in. So, so I've been part, I'm part of Walking the Land. I've been accepted as an ecosystem restoration camp, as an up and coming ecosystem restoration camp. So again, when it gets bigger in the next stage, I can follow up with that. I have um, spoken briefly with Claire Dubois of Tree Sisters, and I'm really enthusiastic about doing some of her woman's work on site here. And that's on hold because she's really busy with other things at the moment. And, um, and I need to uh, now step into building the first steps of the bigger project. And once that's going, I can then start looking at these leads again. So yeah, there's a lot happening. It's really exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hoping that the money will come. I have also on my website, I have a, a page yeah, there. Um, tell the website asking. again. So the website is uh, peacevalleyau.org. And if you go into the website, it gives you a little bit about some of the tools that I use. So I use Joanna Macy's work quite a bit and do the grief stuff um, from the work that reconnects. Uh, that comes out of the uh, work she did with John Seed as well. And um, I also have been working with MIT in America and doing Theory U and am part of a group in Cedar Falls that are doing mindfulness without borders. And so one of the little projects sort of inside the bigger project is to do a small piece of research around um, how people respond to the combination of nature connection with mindfulness and we'll just do a, a sort of a, it's going to be like a three-stage research how they are when they first arrive at Peace Valley how they are when they leave and how they are six months later mm -hmm. again that's it's all just waiting to happen I just need a bigger team now so as my team turns up all of these little leads will be able to put into fruition and uh, and grow so it's, it's super exciting yeah, and again, the question for young people after school, do you accept uh, uh, volunteers to come and do some work for you? Yes. So I, I hold the space in gift economy. So mm. I don't have any income outside of what people donate. So um, that is worth considering for people that are coming. However, if people haven't got any, um, any funds at all, that's, that's okay. I don't turn anybody away. And yes, I accept um, volunteers for or visitors for one day or a week or a month or longer. Um, the longest I had was a lady who came from Canada and she was here for nearly three months. I've had several people come for a month and probably the most come for about a week to two weeks. And I think to get really good value from coming into nature and being in this environment it's important to come for more than one or two days because most people are so exhausted they don't even know they're tired and they get here and they start to relax and then they just crash mm. they need a few days of just doing absolutely nothing because their bodies are so hyped up with today's super fast life in the cities that um yeah it just creeps up on you but what would they do then when they have um, gone to rest and then they are energetic again? Would they plant trees? Would they work in the garden or even do website work or things like that? Yeah, all these things. So everybody yep. can with the skills yep. have on, or learn new skills. I mean, up to a certain extent, you can learn something, especially when you stay longer. In one week, I have sometimes willing workers on organic farms here on my ground in one week it's a bit difficult to teach people uh, what to do, you know, or they know it or, or they don't. But uh, when, when it is a longer time, then it's really, um, you see also progress because otherwise as a host, uh, you better do it alone when you stay only three days and I have to teach you everything. So, uh, but it is a good experience when you stay a little longer and learn these things, you know, because it's, yeah. So much so we can learn when we are open to, 
to experience, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. So now I, I welcome people of all ages and I have had all ages. I've had from sort of 18, I've had young families with children and are up to 70, 80 year olds. So mm. I've had every age. Probably on average, I would say I have um, two age groups and sort of clientele groups. Uh, one is the sort of post-university uh, young people. And the other one is middle-aged women, sort of between 45 and 60. Mm -hmm. People that are looking, people that are in transition, that are looking for a space, uh, somewhere to go to think about what their next steps are. And that yeah. nature is the perfect thing for that. I he I'm hearing the noises of the, the birds in the background. That's so nice to have this music <laughs> running together with us. Yeah. So it's late in the evening now here. It's in the morning. What, what time is it here? Uh, it's 20 to 10 in my time. What time is your time? Uh, 20 to 7 in Queensland time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so although we're in the New South Wales time zone, we use Queensland time because we're so close to the border. Most of our business is done with Queensland and it just gets very confusing because there's an hour difference. Okay, no, time zones is a nightmare. Anyway, it will be dark in a short while. And so I sometimes see you already in the dark. And yeah, yeah at this point, I would say thank you. And people connect with her when you plan to go to Australia. I mean, you don't go to Australia from Europe just for a week. So <laughs> or just now and go, no, you have to plan it a little bit. But I do think uh, that's a good experience. I mean, even in Europe, going into natural places, even here where I am, that's almost natural but you know not like like in australia we have the next neighbor about 100 meters or so or 150 but still it's nature every time when you go out of the city and stay in a place where all these distractions are not there mm -hmm. that's benefit exactly yeah and and the, the, ben the other added Sorry, I'm just going to butt in. The other added benefit of being here with me is that you can't help but do forest bathing because whichever way the wind is blowing, it's blowing all the pheromones from the trees right across my camp. So mm -hmm. from the minute you arrive, you are forest bathing 24-7. <laughs> and you also don't get yeah. in the, into temptation to go to the next city just for a moment and, and go to a cinema or something. You know, it's just not. You just stay with nature and it's really a different a different perspective which you can gain and a different feeling inside you know different yeah. feeling of human purpose <laughs> definitely yeah so thank you for that wonderful conversation and we follow up when the next step when you are about to have done the next step okay so excellent that sounds great Thank you so much. That's been lovely. Thank you.